The Mercedes A-Class has been through more reinventions than David Bowie. Back in the 90s, it started out as an innovative MPV-shaped hatchback that didn't really like corners, but by the time the third generation model arrived in 2012, it had morphed into a conventional family hatchback. Unfortunately, not a very good one. It had a bone-shaking ride, it was noisy, and overall, it was completely outclassed by its main rivals, the Audi A3 and the BMW 1 Series. Thankfully, this fourth generation car is much, much better. It was launched back in 2018, but it's just had a facelift. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking you through everything that's new about it and deciding whether or not this is the best premium hatchback that you can buy today. Before we get started though, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and for a great discount on your next new car, whether it's one of these or something completely different, just head to whatcar.com. So technically this is a facelift, but I've got to be honest, I wouldn't have necessarily spotted all the changes if Mercedes hadn't pointed them out. So there are new LED headlights. These have adaptive high beam assist. That means they can automatically dip and undip themselves to avoid dazzling other road users. You can have more high-tech versions if you go for the Premium Plus package and they have multi-beam technology. So that means they can automatically shape their light pattern while again, avoiding temporarily blinding other drivers. Whichever headlights you go for though, you get a new daytime running light signature. It is basically just a line at the top of the lens there. It doesn't extend down the side here anymore. There is a new front bumper as well. And from where you are, it might look as though there are tiny little silver dots here. But if you come a bit closer, you'll actually see that there are hundreds of little three-pointed stars there. So very subtle, but a really nice touch. Round the back, there is a slightly revised design for the rear diffuser down here. And there's also a different pattern in the LED tail lights, but overall pretty minor changes on the outside. All petrol versions of the A-Class, apart from the crazy fast A45 AMG, now come with mild hybrid technology as standard. What does that mean? Well, it means you get a 14 brake horsepower electric motor that assists the petrol engine. It does give a small boost to performance at low revs, but the main reason it's there is to reduce fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. This A200 version can officially average 48 mpg which isn't bad at all it's about the same as an equivalent bmw 118i although it is worth noting that the audi a335 tsi is even more frugal if you want an a-class though and fuel economy is super important then don't rule out the diesel a200d it costs around a thousand pounds more than this a200 petrol but you should get around 10 miles more from every gallon now before this facelift if you were a company car driver paying benefit in kind tax you'd go for the a250 plug-in hybrid for some reason, that's been dropped from the A-Class hatchback lineup, but you can still have it with the A-Class saloon, and it will save you a fortune in monthly salary sacrifices compared with any of the petrol or diesel models. Inside, there have been some more significant changes, and we'll come to those in a minute. But first, what's been carried over from the pre-facelifted car? Well, the dashboard is identical. So you've still got these turbine-style air vents up here and this climate control panel down here, and the driving position's unchanged as well. So there's still lots of adjustment in the steering wheel and the seat. And if you go for an AMG line version, which is what this car is, you get these sports seats as standard with integrated headrests. In that respect, they're not the most comfortable in the world because they do push your head forward, but they do hold you in place a little bit better than the comfort seats you get on entry-level sport edition trim. Quality is pretty good, certainly in terms of how upmarket and expensive the materials feel. So you've got lots of squidgy plastic and faux suede up here on the dashboard and the same on the insides of the doors here. There's some pretty convincing metal effect down here on the center console and on the steering wheel as well. And although these seats aren't real leather, unless you go for an A35 or A45 hot hatch version, they don't feel at all cheap or plasticky. And that's the important thing. And to be honest, Many buyers these days will prefer not to have real cowhide anyway. Build quality is a different thing though, and some of the fixtures in here do feel a little bit wobbly and less robust than you might expect, given that this is one of the most expensive cars in the class. The Audi A3 and the BMW 1 series, they are more conservative inside and arguably perhaps even a little bit boring, but they do feel that bit more solid and just better screwed together. Now it might appear as though there is one giant screen that stretches across more than half of the dashboard here. It is in fact, however, two 10.25 inch screens butted up against one another behind a single pane of glass. 
All versions now get those screens as standard. On the pre-facelifted car, some of the cheaper A-classes got seven inch screens for the infotainment and the driving display, and they just looked a bit rubbish. But as I say, all versions now get these large screens as standard. The display on the left here is a touchscreen as before, and it's pretty good for resolution. It responds quickly, and the operating system's fairly intuitive as well. So you've got nice big icons with lots of space around them, and only some slightly smaller icons down here for less important things. And that's fine when you are parked up, but when you're driving, using a touchscreen can be quite distracting. And that's why before, on the pre-facelifted car, Mercedes also had a secondary touchpad down here. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't as good as the rotary controllers that you get in a BMW 1 Series or various Genesis and Mazda models, but it was much less distracting than trying to stab away at a touchscreen while you're driving. As you can see, Mercedes has ripped that out and replaced it with a shallow tray here. I'm not entirely sure what that is useful for, but it will probably say that it's done its customer research and that all its customers want are touchscreens everywhere. But the real reason that the touchpad has gone is because it saves money. So Mercedes doesn't have to wire in a secondary controller there. And that is a shame given how much money this car costs. Another really annoying thing about the facelifted A-Class are the controls on the steering wheel. So you used to get proper physical buttons and scroll wheels that were quite easy to use while you're driving. But as you can see, they have been replaced by touch sensitive panels. Now we're not a fan of touch sensitive buttons on steering wheels at all. We've criticized various VW models for this, so we have to criticize these. And they're just quite fiddly. You've got these symbols here. So if I want to adjust the volume of the radio, for example, I have to slide my thumb up and down here. And although technically you can control the infotainment system, to be honest, it requires such intricate fingers that you're really not going to bother. You're just going to use the touchscreen. So that is a shame. Now, Mercedes will point out that there is a voice control system and it is one of the better systems out there actually. So it can help with some things. If I want to adjust the interior temperature, for example, I just say, hey Mercedes. How may I help you? Please set the interior temperature to 22 degrees. I have set the temperature to 22 degrees. There you go. But if I want to do some other, what I would consider quite simple things, it can't necessarily help me. So for example, hey Mercedes. How may I help you? Please bring up Spotify on Apple CarPlay. I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that right now. And then you just think, why did I even bother in the first place? On the subject of Apple CarPlay, all versions of the A-Class get that standard. And if you don't have an Apple, there is Android Auto as well. You also get wireless charging pads as standard. And if you want a more powerful sound system, then you'll need to go for a premium or premium plus package. Getting in the back isn't exactly difficult, although you do have to duck under the roof there. And once you're inside, you will find a reasonable amount of space, actually. I'm just over six foot. This seat in front is set up for my driving position. And as you can see, a reasonable amount of knee room there, about the same as you'll find in an Audi A3. The BMW 1 Series does have a little bit more space in the back. And obviously, if you're prepared to not have a premium badge, there are far roomier cars in this class, like the Ford Focus and the Skoda Octavia. Headroom is also pretty impressive. Again, no issues there. I can sit back in my seat and enjoy some space above my head. It is worth noting though, if you go for a version with a panoramic glass roof, that reduces the height of the ceiling a little bit. As with most other cars in this class, there is a big transmission tunnel on the floor down here. So life isn't that comfortable for middle passenger, but even I would be quite comfortable on here as long as the journey wasn't too long. There's nothing spectacular about the boot of the A-Class, although it's only slightly smaller than those of its main rivals, the A3 and 1 Series. We managed to fit a respectable six carry-on suitcases below the parcel shelf. It is a shame, though, that there is no height-adjustable boot floor because it means there's always a big drop down from the entrance onto the floor of the load bay. Now, all versions of the A-Class, apart from the hot A35 and A45 versions, come with what Mercedes calls lowered comfort suspension. So that means if you go for sporty AMG line trim, you aren't stuck with a rock hard ride, and that is a good thing. In fact, the only time the amount of vertical travel in the suspension can become a problem is around town over speed bumps, actually, because it can be quite easy to catch the nose of the car on the road on the way off the bump, but that's also obviously due to how much ground clearance there is as well. The steering is good too. It's fairly light, which is useful for town driving, but it feels natural and there's enough weight buildup when you're driving quickly to give you confidence to allow you to trust the car. 
There isn't much tire noise, so in our tests, this was actually a slightly quieter motorway cruiser than his two main rivals, the A3 and the 1 series. Although things aren't perfect on the refinement front because the 1.3 litre petrol engine that's found in the entry level A180 and the A200 that I'm driving here can sound a little bit coarse, a little bit tinny, particularly when you rev it hard. The A180 has 134 brake horsepower with a little bit of extra um, from its mild hybrid system. So it's quick enough, but we reckon this A200, which has 161 bhp, is worth the extra because it has a little bit more low rev pull, so you don't need to work it quite as hard. The two litre diesel in the A200D offers very similar outright performance to the A200 petrol, but it has even more low rev pull. And for the standards of the class, at least, it's pretty smooth as well. Now, you used to be able to get an A-Class with a manual gearbox, but you can't anymore. All versions are automatics. And if you go for the diesel, you get an eight-speed auto. We found it a little bit jerky in stop-start traffic, but the seven-speed auto in the petrols is better in that respect. But here's our take on how to spec the perfect A-Class. Unless you want black or white paint for your A-Class, you'll have to stump up extra to open up a larger colour palette. If you like this particular colour, it's called Sun Yellow and it costs £625. As I said earlier, don't rule out the diesel A200D if you do loads of miles, but for most buyers, this A200 petrol is the one to go for. Avoid entry-level Sport Edition trim and go for AMG Line Premium. It's a bit more expensive, but you get sportier styling inside and out, some extra safety aids and dual-zone climate control. Annoyingly, if you want adaptive cruise control on your A-Class, you'll not only need to go for AMG Line Premium Plus trim, you'll also need to fork out another £1,500 on the driving assistance package. Really, that should be standard on a car this expensive. Overall, the A-Class is a great choice for anyone looking for a traditional petrol or diesel hatchback with a posh badge. It's comfortable, easy to drive, and even reasonably practical. Although, if you're a company car driver looking for low tax bills, you might be frustrated there's no longer a plug-in hybrid version of the A-Class hatchback. There is of the Audi A3. But what do you think of the Mercedes A-Class? Let us know in the comments below. And if you haven't quite made your mind up yet, why not check out our reviews of the BMW 1 Series and Audi A3. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.